Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's panel discussion, The Sanctions Dilemma, Navigating Diplomacy and Conflict in Iran and Beyond. My name is Michael Coleman. I'm the head of Programs and Communications here at International House. We're delighted to be working together on today's program with the Pearson Institute for the Study of and Resolution of Global Conflicts. This is a special year for the International House community, as our sister house in New York, the first International House, celebrated their 100th anniversary this past September. International House of Chicago was founded by John D. Rockefeller Jr. in 1932 as a residential and program center with a mission to promote cross-cultural understanding, mutual respect, and friendship among international students, scholars, and the community. That mission also guides the work of the 15 other international houses around the world on four continents. On behalf of the Global International House community, I welcome you again and thank you for joining us. And now I'd like to invite Rushikesh Jadav, Pearson Fellow and student here at the university, to formally introduce our speakers and begin our program. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here on behalf of the Pierce Institute for the study and resolution of global conflict and International House. I would like to welcome all of you and our distinguished guest for today's discussion on the sanctions dilemma navigating diplomacy and conflict in Iran and beyond. My name is Rushikesh Yashwan Zadav. I'm a first year Master of Public Policy student at the Harris School of Public Policy. As a Pearson Fellow, I deeply appreciate these opportunities where we get to engage in critical discussions about complexities of global conflicts and strategies aimed at resolving them. Living in Bosnia and Herzegovina from 2016 to 2018 as a student at the United World College in Mostar sparked questions for me about the nature of nations and states. Bosnia's complexity and complex political structures rooted in compromises between its three main ethnic groups is often framed as an uh, impediment uh, to its progress towards European Union membership. The EU's effort to encourage reforms reflect a broader challenge, the difficulty of shaping nations to meet an idealized version of governance. Bosnia's journey raises fundamental questions about the concept of nation state itself how it can be used to, as a tool to control, what constitutes as an ideal governance, and why attempts to impose such uh, ideals often fail. This brings me to Iran, another nation subject to, subjected to external pressures, this time through sanctions designed to compel internal changes. Sanctions have sought to influence both state behavior and population dynamics, yet their effectiveness remains uh, contested as they often seem to deepen resistance rather than fostering transformation. Uh, the women life freedom protests offer a poignant example of movement that shook the world but was met with overwhelming force from the state, leaving us to question whether these external strategies drive meaningful change or simply entrench existing systems. As we consider these questions today, I encourage all of you to reflect on how international institutions attempt to shape nations why these efforts reveal, what these efforts uh, reveal about global power dynamics, and whether alternative approaches might be better aligned with the complexities of respecting one another's governance and sovereignty. Our speakers today are authors of How Sanctions Work and co-directors of Rethinking Iran Initiative. Vali Nasser and Nargis Bojogli joined in conversation with the University of Chicago professor and Pearson faculty affiliate, Paul Roast. Wali Nasser is the Majid Khaduri Professor of International Affairs and Middle East Studies at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, and a non-resident senior fellow at Atlantic Council South Asia Center. He, serves, he served as the eighth dean of Johns Hopkins SAIS between 2012 and 2019, and served as a senior advisor to U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, Ambassador Richard uh, Holbrook, Holbrook, between 2009 and 2011. Nasser is the author of several books, including The, Disparity, the, the Dispensable Nation, American Foreign Policy and Retreat, 
and democracy in Iran, history, the quest for liberty. Nargis Bojogli, pronounced Narjik Bojogli, I just want to note for myself because uh, forgive me from a pronunciation that I might uh, mispronounce throughout this speech, is an assistant pronouncer, uh, is the assistant professor of Middle East Studies at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. She is an award-winning anthropologist, scholar, and writer, trained as a political anthropologist, media anthropologist, and documentary filmmaker. Uh, Nargis's academic research is at the intersection of media, power, and resistance in Iran and the United States. Her first project focused on regime culture produced in Iran and was based on ethnographic research with uh, Basiji Ansare Hezbollah, the Revolutionary Guard media producers. The resulting book, Iran Reframed, Anxieties of Power in Islamic Republic, revealed several awards, received several awards. She is currently writing her third book on survivors of chemical warfare. Finally, I would like to introduce Paul Rost, who will serve as the moderator for today's discussion. He is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Chicago, where his area of research and teaching is international relations. Uh, Post is also a foreign policy fellow at the uh, Chicago Council on Sh uh, Global Affairs and World Affairs columnist and a faculty affiliate at the Pearson Institute. Paul studies international politics, uh, focusing on international security, diplomacy, and the use of data to study international relations. We look forward to a great discussion with our renowned speakers. Without further ado, please help me welcome our speakers. Thank you. Well, welcome, and thank you for everyone to be here today. Just to make sure everyone can hear me okay? Yeah, okay, that's fantastic. So thank you all for being here today. And I think this is, an, this is a topic that we're gonna be talking about today that I think is always timely, but as for reasons that we'll get into in a little bit here, is especially timely, um, given the current international context. So what I'd like to do is just start off with a few opening remarks, then I'm going to moderate a Q&A, um, and then we'll save about the last 15 minutes or so for audience Q&A. And there will be some mics that'll be coming around so that all of you here, or at least some of you, I'm sure you know, we won't be able to get to everybody, but some of you will be able to ask questions um, before we wrap up today. So by my count, Presently, the United States has sanctions, either comprehensive economic sanctions or targeted sanctions on individuals on roughly 30 some countries. And sanctions, economic sanctions have become a widely used tool by the United States as, other, as well as other Western countries in order to achieve foreign policy goals. And some would claim to achieve foreign policy goals short of the use of force, though I think part of what we're gonna talk about today might question that statement. And of course, sanctions have become something that's very prominent in the news because that was a primary way in which the United States has led the response against Russian aggression against Ukraine, as well as, of course, using military arms as well. But the sanctions has been a key part of it. And now with the incoming Trump administration, we're expecting the use of various types of economic coercion, including sanctions against Iran, China, and a host of other countries. And so for that reason, that is why I think this topic today is going to be most important. And a key reason why I think the topic today and why I think it's great that you're all here today is because two individuals that we have here have just wrote a co-authored book on economic sanctions titled How Sanctions Work, which I should add is available on Amazon and also is at the seminary co-op for you to be able to purchase. And indeed, tomorrow you'll be doing an event on the, the, at the seminary co-op uh, regarding that. So please take advantage to be able to read this book. But of course, we're gonna be talking quite a bit about it today. So professors Bajoli and Nasser have written this book and 
you've also been going around giving you know, a number of talks related to this topic because it is so timely. So I'm sure some of what we're going to talk about today is things that you've talked about at other instances, but hopefully we'll be able to go into some new topics as well. And so for that, my first question is basically just, can we start with a little bit of background? Um, how did this book come about? And in particular, why did you feel that Iran was a key country to be able to focus on for this book? Sure. So um, thank you first so much for, for leading this conversation. And thank you all for being here. And thanks so much for the Pearson Institute and International House for having us. Um, so the idea for this book came about because actually once we started our Trump was there for the first administration, and he started to put maximum pressure uh, sanctions on Iran. Um, and there was this notion and this idea that the maximum pressure sanctions that his administration was putting on would do either one of two things, either compel Iran to come to the table again to renegotiate the nuclear deal that he had just ripped up, or that it would essentially, from the Pompeo State Department's perspective, sort of lead to regime change. Um, and at the time when maximum pressure policy was enacted on Iran, this was the, it, Iran became the most sanctioned country in the world. So we began to think about this question of what, can, do sanctions work, do they not work, what are sanctions? And we began to look around and most of the questions that had been asked about sanctions from either a policy perspective or an academic perspective were looking at sanctions from the perspective mostly of the targeted state um, that's doing the sanctioneering towards the, 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 the country that they're targeting. And very little knowledge was actually out there about what sanctions do on the ground. And so we decided to first bring together over a dozen uh, scholars of various backgrounds from uh, economists to social sciences to um, climate scientists to try to understand what is it that sanctions were doing on the ground in Iran across these various sectors and across various sectors of society. And then once we began to look at that data and sort of put it more into conversation with what policymakers were saying and other academics, we also began to come to this conclusion in our conversations that people were asking the wrong questions about sanctions. Of course, sanctions work. When you have a country with the political and economic might of the United States putting sanctions, especially uh, for over 40 years in the case of Iran, there is work that these sanctions are doing. But do they actually get to the policy objectives that the sanctioneering state is attempting to get to? And that became the sort of key component of uh, the, the research question for the book. And then as we began to do the book, it's obviously a co-authored book. So I'm an anthropologist, a uh, valued political scientist. Um, our other co-authors include um, Javad Salehi Esfahani, who's an economist, and Ali Vaez, who is a nuclear physicist but works in the world of, of policy. And one of the reasons we decided to co-author the book was that, first of all, sanctions is very comprehensive. It does different kinds of work on the, on the economy of a country. It does different kinds of work on uh, people in a society depending on where they lie in, this, in the social strata and sort of their status markers. It does different kinds of work um, at different points and also obviously regionally and, and elsewhere. And that's why we sort of brought all of our heads together. And the last thing I'll say about this is that Sanctions are very abstract. If you ever read a, a piece of you know, writing on sanctions that the, that the Department of Treasury puts out, it's really difficult to understand what is the sanction regulation even about because it's written by lawyers and bankers. And then it's really difficult to see what sanctions actually do because it's not like a hot war where a bomb drops and you can take a picture of it. It's difficult to sort of pinpoint exactly what sanctions are doing. And so in order to show people, show the readers what sanctions do, we focused, especially the first half of the book, very much on people's stories and looking at this issue very much from a ground up perspective. So it's a question about, or it's a book about what sanctions do to a society and the politics and the economy of that society, and then the ripple out effects of that on a regional and then therefore international scale. It's, that's great. I think that really does help to situate, again, the background of this book and why it came about. And it leads naturally into the next question I have, which is, and you've already touched on this, which is, of course, the title of the book is How, Not Do. Because as you said, of course, sanctions work, but do they work as intended? 
And so when it comes to talking about the economic damage that is done, I'd love to be able to pick up on what you just said at the end there about talking about the impact of sanctions on people's lives. So what are some of the stories that you that both of you saw or you've, you've read about or experienced regarding how the sanctions are actually impacting people on the ground? Okay. Um, so sanctions are, what we found first and foremost is that sanctions have generational impacts, just like hot wars do. So what does that mean? It means that for a country like Iran that has been under one form of sanctions or another for about 40 some odd years, um, for many people, sanctions have been the backdrop of their everyday lives for their entire existence on this earth, right? And so what that means is that it seeps into your everyday life as far as not only just when maximum pressure sanctions are imposed, like during the Trump administration, when inflation goes really high. And so actually the amount of food that you can buy is impacted by that, as we all sort of know in one way or another through, through the inflation that we're currently living in. So it has an impact on everyday life in that capacity. But, but what we found more so is that because the targeted nation of who's under sanctions feels that they are under war, they securitize the domestic situation even more so than it has been securitized in the past. And so the everydayness in which this is impacted is anywhere from a single mother who has to take on multiple different jobs in order to be able to make ends meet, to student activists who have to go underground or stop their activism and, and civic um, sort of activism in general, to uh, those who very much benefit from a sanctions regime and actually don't want sanctions to go away. Because what you have under sanctions is a, a weakening of the middle class, which we'll get into in this conversation and how that happens, into the poverty levels. But you also simultaneously have uh, the very sort of enrichment of the political and military elite in a sanctions country. And we'll talk about how that happens and why. But that also means that you have people who are entrenched and not wanting sanctions to go away because they make a lot of money off of busting through sanctions. And then you have people who are sort of at the brunt end of, of their lives economically shifting and then the opportunities available for them shifting. In addition to like social infrastructure like hospitals over time becoming worse and worse. So it has an impact on pretty much every, every aspect of your life. So this is, I think we could go directly into this next point here because one thing that listening to you talk made me realize something that maybe I didn't appreciate fully before is how not just that sanctions could have questionable effectiveness, but in many ways they could be counterproductive mm -hmm. in that they could actually say enable a government that maybe is seeking to be repressive, maybe a government that's seeking to be able to clamp down society, actually have a justification for doing so. And that's something that I'm taking away from this. So would, I think we'd be able to speak more about that, both how it maybe is counterproductive in this way, and then also this notion of who is benefiting mm -hmm. actually in those societies and governments from it. I mean, building on, 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 first of all, let me also begin by thanking you, thanking the Pearson Institute and, and also the International <coughs> House for bringing us here. It's wonderful being at the University of Chicago. Uh, building on what Nargis was saying, I mean, particularly because sanctions are left on a country for a prolonged period of time. I mean, wars happen, they're destructive, but, but uh, there's one year, one month, you know, it stops at some point, and then you begin to think about the day after in a war. With sanctions, and particularly the way the United States uses it, is that you impose it and you forget about it. In fact, we, we should talk about this. We really don't have mechanisms under which sanctions are lifted. Mm -hmm. The United States li literally cannot lift sanctions, almost. You could, you could basically come to that point that it's a one-way thing you put on. So as a political scientist, the way I looked at it is that sanctions essentially becomes the political economy of the country. So it's more than just making the government more repressive in a narrow window. It changes the entire structure of governance and society in w ways that are counterproductive to, uh, to uh, our longer objective is, for instance, a country like Iran or Russia would become democratic. So the idea is that we want regime change, but the regime change that we achieve is to make the country more authoritarian, more resilient in authoritarianism, and change it. So, for instance, I, I, uh, these are sort of uh, things we observed, and some of it is in the book, some of it is in the papers that we commissioned. There were proponents of the nuclear deal in Iran. 
in, in 2013. And their view, the view of the Iran's president at the time, which was a big proponent of the nuclear deal, was that if the nuclear deal lasted, that the size of Iran's middle class would expand by 35% over 10 years. And his team had knew enough political economy theory to know that's the way a regime changes, right? It's the larger size of an affluent private sector that basically will vote for reform, will vote for change, will be integrated into the world economy, much like we've seen it in myriad of other countries in the developing South. And under maximum pressure, in fact, the opposite happened. 20% of Iran's middle class by year 2022 fell below the poverty belt. For those who didn't count as, as poor, they lost their purchasing power. Money they spent on education, on travel, on tourism, on food, on business, etc. And instead, as this private sector shrank, a different kind of a po economic political network took its place. And it's too simplistic to say that Iran is managed by authoritarian government or by the revolutionary guards. That, uh, that, that doesn't quite capture the, the, the sort of the political economy of Iran, which is, which is now tied to sanctions, is extremely wealthy, uh, but, but it, it essentially is no longer, you no longer have the private sector that the political scientists believe is the agent of change towards democracy. The basis of democracy withered away. And if we, for instance, if we look back at 2022, why did the protest in Iran not catch fire, right? The simple answer is actually because the political economy of Iran changed under sanctions, right? So, so in a way, uh, unless a regime completely collapses or you go to war with it like we did with Iraq, the United States has not guaranteed that the Islamic Republic of, uh, of Iran is actually resilient. It's, it's the political economy of the, that country is now much more supportive of authoritarianism. Mm. And in the meantime, as Nargis said, this is not the authoritarianism of before 2018. It's much worse. Mm. It's much more vicious, much more aggressive, much more, much more because it, v, v, Iran sees itself in a war footing that it, it, it has now taken over all of civil society, all of, all of media, all of this various uh, sort of nooks and crannies in society that you could organize politically in favor of democracy have, have, have disappeared. And then on top of it, also Iran has become far more aggressive in terms of its nuclear program, in terms of regional behavior. I mean, based on America's own saying or Israel's verdict, Iran is behind everything that's happening in the Middle East. So how did, how did even if you accepted this, this rhetoric, which is particularly very popular on the Republican MAGA side of things, what did actually the, the, the sanctions achieve, which is a much more stable government, which is farther away from a democratic transition than it was before maximum pressure sanctions? No, this is, this is, again, for me, this is uh, really enlightening to be able to think about this counterproductive nature of sanctions. And just keeping the focus on Iran, given what's being said about how the sanctions are counterproductive. If the U.S. does have security interests and legitimate security concerns regarding Iran, if the sanctions aren't working in the way that they're supposed to be working, um, what would be the alternative? And especially to elaborate more on this point of, and does that alternative actually include lifting sanctions given that there's not a mechanism for that? So I'd love to be able to hear more about what would be the alternative given this counterproductive nature of the sanctions. So, I mean, first of all, this book is about Iran because we, not only because we are Iran experts and, and, and Iran was the focus at, at that particular point in time, but because we also thought that Iran, at the time we wrote the book, which is before Russia invaded, Ukraine was the most sanctioned country in the world. It had been sanctioned for longest time period since 1979. And particularly since 2015, it was under maximum pressure sanctions. You know, the Trump administration imposed maximum pressure in a way to basically bring out what they believe would be the full, uh, you know, consequence and product of sanctions. So it was, it, this was the perfect country to actually examine sanctions in. But, 
we also have to note that sanctions has now become American foreign policy by default. Uh, since, the, adding to the statistics you said, since uh, 2001, since the turn of the uh, uh, 21st century, American sanctions have increased by 900%. This is the to-go policy on, on, on everything. Russia, I, I'm sure China is around the corner. You said 30 countries, I'm sure by the, in, a, in 10 years time, it's going to be many more countries. So Iran essentially is a canary in the coal mine, or if say the symbol of what's gonna happen. The United States, I mean, our, our goal is for people to look at this book and say, this is the world that the, this is what the United States is doing to the world. It's changing the world exactly in the opposite direction that it wants. The more you impose sanctions, the more you're going to have poverty, the less middle class, the less democracy. So you, you read this book, you would say, this is the future of Russia, right? So, so, so in a way, uh, 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 it's, it's important to sort of put it in that, in that context. Now, the, good que the question is, what else would the, how else would the United States deal with countries? I mean, as, as a political scientist, and again, you know, having to be true to how we've been trained, Countries don't transform by you putting your knee on their neck, right? Uh, they, they transform by engaging them. I mean, the, the way the proponents of the nuclear deal in Iran saw it is that if sanctions were rift, lifted with the nuclear deal, that then, uh, uh, you know, businesses, American businesses would go to Iran, European businesses would go to Iran. To go to Iran, there has to be an embassy. To invest in Iran, Iran has to change its laws on, on arbitration, on, on property ownership, on joint venture uh, ownership. You can look across the developing world. That's what happens when foreign companies come in. You either don't let them in, or if you let them in, you have to change to accommodate them. And then you, know, you have a gradually increasing size of the Iranian population that will be integrated into the world economy. And then basically that forces change. So if we really want to change the regime in Iran, if that's the security issue, we're going about it the wrong way. Mm. If the goal was to get Iran off a nuclear deal, uh, then you have to be able to lift sanctions. That's what the Obama administration promised Iranians. President Obama went out of his way to say, I don't want to change your regime. He, in fact, was the first president to refer to Iran not as the regime, but as the Islamic Republic of Iran in his first uh, uh, pronouncements. And then, you know, he, he, he had a letter, a, a sort of a pen pal with the supreme leader in Iran for a while of sending letters, receiving letters, in which the other side came to the be believe that this person does not want, this president does not want to change the regime. He wants to negotiate. And so what was the promise of negotiations was that the United States will lift sanctions on Iran. So you want, you have one lesson from the Obama administration is that you, you actually talk to people. That's the way to deal with it. Secondly, if you, if you put sanctions to change behavior, you have to be able to lift sanctions once that behavior is changed, right? Because otherwise countries come to the conclusion that sanctions are permanent and therefore there's no point in engaging. So the, so the big lesson that President Trump taught everybody with coming out of the nuclear deal and maximum pressure is, th is that there's no point in negotiating on sanctions relief. Really. Once you go under sanctions, you may as well now buckle down in order to, to survive sanctions. So, you know, our goal is not to say sanctions are evil. Sanctions, I think, are like a scalpel. It depends on the hand that, how, how you use the scalpel. Uh, yes, sometimes the alternative to sanctions is m m awful, but as sanctions is becoming America's foreign policy, pretty much, then it is important for us to put to debate, you know, that we should not just keep proceeding with this, we should think hard about how do you improve upon it? How do you actually use sanctions and sanctions lifting in a way that actually would bring Iran to the table? And I'm sure we're gonna to get to it. I mean, the Iranians want to negotiate with the Trump administration. And so these issues will become, come to the fore that whether Trump this time around uh, will prove to be the president who's willing to lift sanctions and actually does get them lifted because then that would change that conversation uh, very differently. Absolutely. Did you want to build on The only point? thing that I would build on that is to say that um, with this increase of over 900% since the 21st century, 
One of the goals of this book, as we're mentioning, is to really drive a public conversation and a conversation in the policy world about the, our addiction to sanctions by this point and the fact that because we cannot actually lift sanctions because of the way that it's spread out across different, uh, from the executive branch to the congressional branch, to, right? It's spread out across different agencies of the U.S. government. So even when Obama could lift a certain number of executive branch um, sanctions, he could not lift congressional sanctions. So this is also something that other countries have learned along the way. They understand that when you come under sanctions, you're pretty much not get, getting off sanctions. And so you begin to create infrastructure, which is what Iran and, China, and Iran and Russia have done, to do trade away from the US dollar, right? To build actual um, transportation routes now that would get goods um, from uh, uh, across Iran into Russia, for example. Or BRICS has been having increasing conversations about the need to build trade that goes uh, be, you know, around the US dollar, for example. Now, those may or may not pan out, but the, the fact is that the conversation increases because of the weaponization of the US dollar and because countries have learned that when you be, are sanctioned, you can't, it's almost impossible to come off of sanctions unless there's full-scale regime change. So to continue with this notion of sanctions being counterproductive and perhaps needing to think about alternatives to sanction, uh, one idea I want to hear from both of you talk about, and, and forgive me if I read this into the book, and, but one takeaway I had from the book was that in, one claim that you make is that in some respects, the use of economic sanctions is actually worse than the use of military violence in terms of going to war, um, or at least it's the equivalent of it. And I could see where in some respects that could be the case, especially maybe from the standpoint of people on the home front, that they would say, look, this is whether we're at war, we're, we're experiencing economic hardship. But I'd like to be able to hear more about that, about how do we think about sanctions in comparison to just going to war? Because in many ways, I think the attraction of sanctions is it is something we can do without having to go to war. But if we put it on the level of saying, actually, in many respects, it's equivalent to it, it may even be worse, how would you be able to, can you elaborate on that idea? Well, I mean, there's a social side of that that uh, is also important. Uh, well, I mean, it depends on how devastating a war is. I mean, if you looked at what Russia, Ukraine, or you looked at Gaza, you would say, no, sanctions cannot do that kind of a destruction of displacing, you know, millions of people and, and leveling a place. But uh, I think it is equivalent to a war in the sense of the way it transforms society. Uh, I mean, the points that Nargis made about how you build different infrastructure, after a while, it basically hardwires the society very differently, as if a country is in a prolonged period of war. All of your industrial relations, networks, everything changes. But also, because sanctions are there for a long period of time, their effects, as Nargis said, becomes generational. You don't bounce back from it. So Iraq, when sanctions were put on it at the time, of, even though it had gone through a massive war with Iran, which had killed several hundred thousand Iraqis, still at the point when Saddam invaded Kuwait, Iraq was not only a wealthy country, Iraq had the highest rate of engineers per capita in the Arab world, had the lowest infant mortality, had the largest life, longest life expectancy and the largest middle class. In fact, it was probably the most modern society, advanced society in the Arab world at the time, or one of them. And you would have said it's the most democracy ready by social science. If you read Samuel Huntington's second wave, et cetera, you say all the, all the right indices are there. The decade of massive sanctions on Iraq eviscerated all of that, eviscerated. So when the United States arrived in Baghdad, there was no engineers or as such. There was no middle class. It was a poor society that had been battered. And the fact that that regime left, Iraq has not bounced back and it will not bounce back. And we're actually witnessing that in Iran. That's actually the most tragic part because you know, societies or social classes that, that you know, move below a poverty level after a certain point in time, they just don't come back. And so, so, do, so in that sense, the impact is, is like, a, like what a war could do to a country. 
The other things I would add to that is that we're seeing now from uh, the Cuban and Venezuelan cases that sanctions lead to very large migration pushes, actually. Um, so you're not seeing similar numbers coming out of a place like Iran or even Russia. But when you, depending on the economy and the structure of the state that you're sanctioning and how long it's been sanctioned for, it does also potentially have the migratory pull and push out that wars do. The second thing that I would say to this is sanctions are not just economic, right? So economic sanctions happen, but they're part of a broader policy that's taking place. And so that also constitutes, from both the perspective of policymakers in the targeted nation, as well as US policymakers. So what do I mean by this? The United States, when it imposes maximum pressure sanctions on Iran, but it also did the same thing on Venezuela and Cuba, it just wasn't as loud about it. But there was maximum pressure sanctions across all three of these countries during the Trump administration. Um, what you have is not just economic like, pressure, but you also have covert warfare that's happening. You have uh, cyber warfare, you have media warfare, you have psychological operations that are taking place. This is all happening in tandem with the economic pressures. So the targeted state and society begins to um, experience sanctions as a multi-fronted sort of shadow war. That in the case of Iran, because of the geopolitics of the region, at times that actually does push out into hot war, and at times it remains in the shadows. For example, prior to October 7th, in all of the various skirmishes that Iran and Israel were having with one another. Those, what all of that does is that it turns the decision making of the targeted state into one of, of a, 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 a shadow war is an intelligence war, first and foremost. So that means that the security establishment of a targeted state comes to the forefront of decision making power in that state. That's on the one hand. Number two is that sanctions, when you target countries like Iran, Cuba, Venezuela, Russia, North Korea with sanctions, the, the crux of or the backbone of the political culture of these states is not going to be like, oh, I'm so sorry, the West, I made you mad. Let me do something. You know, I'm going to come to your good graces again. You're dealing with states and with political structures and cultures that believe, rightly or wrongly, that they are dealing with an imperialist power that is bullying them. And so they're not going to put their hands in the air and say, oh, I'm sorry. They're going to try to figure out how do I bust through your sanctions? Because I think your sanctions on me are illegitimate or illegal or however they conceive of them, right? So what does sanctions busting mean? Sanctions busting means that you are now engaging on trade on the international markets in an illegal way because uh, formal trading is no longer available to you because the international banking system or the insurance companies or these various corporations do not want to risk doing trade with a country like Iran because of the, uh, the blowback effect it'll have on them from the United States. So who is able to bust through sanctions then? Independent businesses in a country like Iran get iced out of the market very quickly because to do illegal trade on the black market, the price of everything shoots up by multiple amounts. So independent businesses after a while no longer have the capital available to be able to engage in that kind of trade. Instead, the businesses that are able to engage in that kind of trade, both from a capital perspective, how much money they have at their disposal, but also because you're running into illegal circles now and you need to be able to do trade on the black market, are those tied to the military, intel, and political elite of states. This is why no matter what, whether you're looking at Iran or you're looking at Cuba or you're looking at Venezuela or any of these other sanctioned states, over time what you see is that those whose uh, wealth and power mushrooms are those tied to the military and intel elite in these countries because they are the ones at the forefront of busting through sanctions as well as the military being on the forefront of what comes in and out of customs along the borders. So when you drive a, an economy into the black and gray markets like that, it's quite, kind of similar to like cartel economies in Latin America. When you drive the economy into that, into that sort of realm, everything is happening in cash or crypto. There's a lot of kickback that's happening. There's a lot of corruption that's happening. That means that a lot of cash is flowing in an economy like Iran's. And, that, and there's a need to wash that cash. Then this has a lot of like cultural and social implications with it. But the 
reason that we say it's like war is because of all of these different elements. And the very last point I'll put on this is also because sanctions policymakers in the United States talk about and write about what they're doing as if it's war. Mm -hmm. They themselves use the language of warfare. They themselves say that we are doing economic warfare, so the Pentagon does not have to put boots on the ground. So not only is it experienced as warfare from the point of view of policymakers and decision makers in a targeted society, but also sanctions policymakers in the United States themselves talk about it as a war. Can I just add uh, yeah, a point? I mean, it's not directly related, but uh, to, 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 to the question you asked. Uh, I mean, already under sanctions, a quarter of Venezuela's population has left the country. Another quarter is about to leave the country. And that influx of well, where are they going? They're all heading towards the US border. Right. And this actually was monumental in our election here, yeah. right? So in some ways, the migration crisis we faced was actually generated by, by lazy sanctions that we just put on Venezuela. And unless you lift those sanctions, you're not going to have people actually stay in the in, in, in Venezuela. Yeah, and I think that's a that, that was exactly something I, w I was going to bring up in light of what you were just saying. That yeah, you know, we can think about the border crisis as being one of these unintended consequences of the fact that we use sanctions so you know indiscriminately, if you will, and then not thinking about the various second order, third order effects, the illicit market effects. But yes, I think the border crisis saying, why do we have a border crisis? Say, well, look at US sanctions policy. I think that's a connection that a lot of people don't appreciate. So I think that is a fantastic point to be able to think about these second order, third order effects. I have one more question I'm gonna ask, and then we're gonna turn it over to the audience here. Um, and this is a question just out of my own personal curiosity. And I wanted to ask both of you, as experts on Iran and specifically US-Iran relations, but a big reason why the US has the sanctions on Iran is of course the concerns about Iran's nuclear program. And one thing I've pondered about is, would it actually be that bad if Iran had a nuclear weapon? In other words, is it something that, because this seems like something that is bipartisan, in terms of we do not want Iran to have a nuclear weapon. Even Obama's administration with the Iran nuclear deal was about preventing Iran from having a nuclear weapon. But would it, in your opinion, would it really be that bad if Iran developed a nuclear weapon? In other words, are we putting all this effort into stopping something that maybe the consequences of it aren't as great as the consequences from the policies we're using to try to prevent it? Well, I mean, the short answer, yes, it wouldn't be good. Let's <laughs> uh, 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 let's. I mean, bad is maybe, but I would definitely say it's not good for varieties of reasons. One is that it will lead to proliferation elsewhere, out of vanity or fear of Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, uh, etc. Iran would be the first country that would become nuclear through the non non-proliferation treaty to which it's signatory. The other countries, North Korea, India, Pakistan, Israel. They had never signed the NPT agreement. So then basically you would say the entire international non-proliferation regime would collapse. But I would say before we contemplate that, because I know that, I mean, there are people in the Trump orbit who have been saying that, yeah, you know, so what if there are two bombs, leave it alone, let's focus on China. But, but I think we do have alternatives. There have been alternatives here. There was a nuclear deal that didn't remove the program as a whole, but basically froze the program at that point. Uh, and, and, and I think still the Iranians are, are talking about it. It's only in the context of the recent Israeli-Iranian exchange of missiles that we've heard murmurs in Iran that they should actually change their position on nuclear weapons and, and um, get nuclear weapons. Like, you know, the Supreme Leader supposedly has a fatwa which bans nuclear weapons uh, after Israel's latest attack on Iran at a university a student asked them are you willing to change your fatwa and he vaguely answered that whatever is in Iran's national interest shall happen right which basically left the door open mm -hmm. but I, I actually believe until now and even now Iran's intention is not to get nuclear weapon was actually was actually building the program for large parts as a negotiation to lift sanctions. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you why, why this logic is. Because when, if you look at the case of Iran and now Russia, once you impose sanctions, a country does one or two th bad things and it gets sanctions. 
as Nagya said, even if they were not anti-imperialist, etc., and, and, and they said, okay, we'll, do, we'll undo those one or two things, the sanctions are not going to get lifted. To lift sanctions, you actually have to do five more bad things to lift the sanctions on the previous thing. I mean, in, in, in 2003, Iran, when Iran's nuclear program was found, it had 119 centrifuges only. The Europeans negotiated a deal with Iran that it would freeze the program right there and then with only 119 centrifuges in exchange for sanctions relief. The Bush administration vetoed it. The Iranian conclusion was that our program is too small to be taken seriously. And so they went, they, they, they started building centrifuges. By the time President Obama went to the table, they had 120,000 centrifuges. Mm -hmm. When Biden administration came in, it decided that you know, maximum pressure wasn't too bad. Let's just continue. Right. And so the Supreme Leader in Iran announced that we're going to go to 60% enrich, enrichment. The United States came to table in Vienna, right? So, so the, the fact that we don't lift sanctions actually creates an incentive that in order to get America's attention or bring it to the table, you have to actually behave worse. Good behavior doesn't lift sanctions. Only bad behavior lifts sanctions. So you, you could say that at this juncture where Iran is literally weeks away from uh, uh, you know, getting enough material for one bomb, uh, and yes, Israel can claim that we destroyed the plants that creates a critical part of nuclear, but they can rebuild that. All right, they'd be six months behind, a year behind, but they could rebuild that in a fortified way. If, if the Trump administration is serious, short of war to stopping Iran's program, the only way it can happen is actually to lift sanctions. Uh, otherwise, yes, Iran will decide that you know, it has to keep going further in order to get its attention. And also, let me, let me just say that Iran would not get a day in, in a president's attention if it did not have this nuclear program. Yeah. So it's very easy for like Venezuela, for America to put these sanctions and then just forget about the country. Right? We're not having any debate unless the border does it. Right. Right? If, if Maduro really wants to negotiate sanctions, he should just basically send his entire population to the border. Right. So, so, so we build a case in which the countries look at what is it that might, what shiny object may hold the attention of the American president. And if I could just add one quick yeah, point please. to this, is Iran is under more than just nuclear sanctions, too. And this is part of the, right, it, we focus on nuclear sanctions in the book because that was the focus of the deal and then later maximum pressure, but it's also under different kinds of sanctions. And um, this question about um, sanctions is also, and the Washington Post just did a series on this last week about the lobbying industry that's developed around sanctions, right? And this is another part of this, is not only is there an entrenched elite in a sanctioned country that becomes rich off of sanctions busting, but now there's an entire lobbying industry in Washington that, for example, if Obama or you know, if Trump wants to lift sanctions on X country, there's a lot of vested interests now in the city that doesn't want sanctions lifted on Cuba, for example, which is like the number one case of sanctions having not worked. It's a really easy case. Anyone can probably can agree to that. But there are invested lobbies to make sure that those sanctions are not lifted. So this is you know, sort of a broader question on our foreign policy, um, in addition to sort of what the targeted country can or cannot do. No, it's an excellent point. It's an absolutely excellent point. There's a whole host of reasons that there's sanctions on Iran, which goes back to, again, your entire motivation for writing this book. It is, you know, up until the war in Ukraine, it was the most sanctioned country in the world. Um, and so, again, just as another reminder, you can get their book at Amazon as well as the seminary co-op. But with that, I'm going to now turn to the audience. We have some mics um, that are here. So we'll go ahead and go to the question right here in the front. Uh, right there, and the mic's going to come around to you. So, the gentleman in the reddish shirt there. Thank you for this discussion. I have two quick questions, somewhat cynical. Um, the first is, uh, do you think sometimes political leaders uh, apply sanctions not to, you know, foster regime change, uh, but just to do something, right? Like uh, Russia invades Ukraine, there's a public uproar. We don't want to spill American blood there. We don't want to, uh, but we can also cannot do nothing. So why don't we just slap some sanctions? Works, works, work, works, doesn't work, who cares? Um, second, um, you've made a, a good case about 
um, sanctions not work in terms of changing the regime's behavior or uh, leading to regime change. But there are certain countries where changing the regime behavior or regime change is probably off the books. Like it's not gonna happen. North Korea, China, it's not gonna happen. What if the goal is not to make them change their behavior, but just to, just to weaken them? We don't want them to get advanced technologies. We don't want them to get uh, you know, a, a good trading network. We, we wanna impoverish them. We wanna you know, ma make sure they're gonna be, they have been hostile, they will continue being hostile, but we're gonna try to make sure they're as weak as possible. Does it work in that sense, even though it might uh, provoke more hostility and more uh, resistance to change? Yeah, so very good question. Um, for the first, um, yeah, yes, it can very much be, this, for the, your second question, it can very much be that. It can be a, um, an attempt at just weakening uh, that state or that regime, but, but n none of this exists in a vacuum. So again, going back to the Cuba example, you cannot weaken the Cuban state and the Cuban people pretty much more than you already have unless you drop a nuclear bomb there. But, it, and, it, and it does serve as an example across Latin America, like do not go communist, look at what we're gonna do to you. So it serves that example by weakening the state and the society to the, to the extent that it has. But it is, it is within the orbit of Russia and Russia will not let go as well as China of something like Cuba, right? And, and so it, these things also exist within these, these broader, um, regional and international sort of competing orders against one another. Um, and this is part of why Iran has been attempting so much to build these bridges towards Russia and towards other places in order to say, you can weaken us to an extent, but now we're going to have partners to sort of push back at this. Um, and I'll let Vadi sort of speak to the, the repercussions of some of that. Your other question, I would say, yes, 100%, it can just be, we're doing something without actually doing anything at all. Um, and that's part of it, is it just serves as like a headline that, that makes us feel good about ourselves. I, I would say the first question, that's the only place you could say that sanctions actually work, <laughs> no ifs and buts. Uh, and, and, but on the second one, uh, I would say, uh, well, it hasn't worked with North Korea. I mean, yes, North Korea is weaker, but in ca case things that we care about, nuclear weapons, ICBMs that could reach the United States, threatening Japan, war on South Korea, et cetera, it's all, it's all actually getting stronger and stronger. Secondly, I would not, I would not say readily that uh, we cannot change any regime because we haven't really tried it. I mean, we really have never sat down with North Korea and actually had a conversation about sanctions lifting in exchange for what? Right? I mean, you're not going to change the regime as a whole, but you could change certain things. It's a proposition that has been dismissed without having been tested, mm. right, uh, at all. And so, and I, ha I would actually say that uh, it's very important that between two, 2013 uh, uh, and 20, sorry, between 2015 and uh, 2020, when Trump came out of the nuclear deal, Iranian foreign, uh, foreign minister, the Korean foreign minister, Iranian president met routinely and they compared notes about uh, what was happening. In other words, the, the North Koreans were interested to see whether there would actually be a possibility of sanctions lifting. I remember there was a point at which the president of uh, South Korea, President Park, uh, went to Tehran and promised a, a billion dollar of South Korean investment in Iran. Uh, and, and it was a very peculiar thing. Uh, I remember I was in South Korea and actually members of his party said that was a specifically a message to North Korea. Mm. And what happened, the United States actually prevented South Korea from making that investment at all by imposing further sanctions that would block it. So, so I'm not saying that North Koreans are not interested. We just have never tested this. Very good. All right, let's go to, we'll go to a question right here in the front. Yes. No, it's well, I think we want to get it on the recording, too, so. Thank you both for coming. While the last question was cynical, my question is more optimistic. Is there anything about the new administration that gives you hope maybe there would be a new path? Military intervention, no. Sanctions don't work. Is there anything that you've heard or makes you feel more potentially optimistic, especially given that there's a significant portion of Iranian Americans who voted for Trump, 
There's a significant portion of Iranians in Iran who want Trump. Elon Musk met with the UN, Iranian UN ambassador. So that's my question. Well, uh, uh, I mean, my view of this is a bit unorthodox. Uh, I mean, I, I, I do think that the lessons learned by Trump and perhaps some in, in his orbit is that maximum pressure really didn't work. It actually brought Iran and the United States to the verge of war, which is something that, that uh, he doesn't want. Um, and also, I think the important thing about Trump is that, first of all, he's the strongest American president we've had for a long time, right? Uh, and uh, particularly with the sort of right side of the political spectrum, which is much more hardline on foreign policy, et cetera. Which, uh, uh, if you were sitting in Iran and said, if everything aligned, he's much better capable of delivering a deal and making it stick than the Democrats would. At least the Iranian experience is that they weren't, they weren't very good at, that, uh, good at that. I mean, if you look at the example with the Taliban, he's the only American president who sit down and talk to the Taliban and invite them to Camp David. And the Republicans didn't say anything uh, in opposition. And, and, so, and also, I think the, the other factor is that he's the only American president, last time and this time, who is completely divorced from the you know, structure of American foreign policy thinking from this, what you want to call it, the strategic culture that dominates in Washington. The assumptions, the methodology of analysis, the usual conclusions that whether you're Democrat and Republican, you arrive at. The fact that it's completely transactional uh, and not wedded to these are the bad guys, we don't talk to them, you know, we, we have, you know, sort of the momentum of American foreign policy does present certain uh, possibilities. I mean, I'm more, up, put it this way, given what I said, I'm more optimistic that there will be a deal under Trump than I was a deal under Harris. Hmm. Do you want to share? No, we have, let's get another, all the way in the back. Gentleman with the glasses. Yes, right there. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, my name is Gonzalo Botas. Thank you very much for your, for your talk. Very interesting on secondary effects of sanctions. And my question is, uh, I was wondering whether there's an effective way to design sanctions. So we've seen the effects, but I, you, there were talks of Russia, for example, and that could be an example of when sanctions could be warranted. They, they came after an invasion of the Crimea in 2014, also an invasion of Ukraine in 2022. So one could argue that those sanctions were warranted, not with the attempt to change the regime, but to make it costly to that person who wants to, or to that country that wants to undertake this kind of actions. So my question is whether under a scenario where sanctions may be useful, or maybe the actual only tool available below war, are, is there an effective way to design them? Um, I think that uh, this is an excellent question, and this is a question that actually the initiative that Vadi and I co-direct, the Sice Rethinking Iran Initiative, is taking up this question this academic year in D.C. Um, about can sanctions be reformed, or are there different ways to put sanctions on, and this is a conversation that we're having um, uh, very regularly at this point with policymakers and academics. Um, but. What I would say to sort of that question, or the way that I've been thinking about it and what I've been hearing about it in general is, um, sanctions are not just something that, well, first of all, your own example, Russia, you know, Crimea happens, Russia gets sanctions, Iran comes under maximum pressure sanctions as a way to deter other countries from coming and you know, doing things that, that might hurt them in this sort of maximum way. Russia still invades and understands it's gonna come under sanctions. So I think a very real question American policymakers need to ask themselves is, does sanctions actually have the ability to deter anymore or not? I think that's a fundamental question we need to ask that, needs, that um, we need to contend with. And depending on our answer to that, I think then we need to really seriously consider um, not only just the impact of sanctions, but what are other countries learning about the fact that the U.S. is so addicted to sanctions? So our addiction to sanctions means that not only are countries willing to sort of forego something that Woodrow Wilson, when sanctions were being 
first created and implemented said that sanctions are such a silent, deadly weapon that will suffocate to such an extent that no other country would dare to sort of go that route of the pariah state to come under sanctions. That's simply not the case anymore after a little bit less than 100 years of sanctioning. Um, so that would be sort of where I think we need to focus. It's just not working. I just had one quick point. I mean, if, if uh, you want to put cost on Putin, but unless you told Putin that if you come out, these sanctions would be lifted, then it's sunk cost, right? So why would, it, why would he actually not, not just persevere? And if you listen to pronouncement by President Biden, the administration over, since the war started, they have not once said that if you leave these territories, if you end the war, the sanctions would be lifted. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So with that, those were excellent questions, but we are out of time. So please thank me. Oh, please help me to thank. <laughs> thank you. That as well. <laughs> thank that me as well. too. <laughs> please help me to thank Professors Fajoli and Nasser for the great talk today. And thank you all of you for coming out today. So thank you. Thank you. Great.